This show is supported by State Farm. You have insurance for your home, your health, and your car. Why don't you have insurance for your small business? So many small business owners think they don't need or don't even know about small business insurance. Protecting a source of revenue is one thing, but so is protecting all of your hard work and your team members. State Farm agents are all small business owners too, so they know how to help small business owners choose personalized policies that fit their budgets. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Talk to your local agent today. If your roof starts to leak or your floor's really squeak, you live in a money pit. Money pit. If your basement needs a pump or your place looks like a dump, you live in a money pit. Money pit. Pick up the telephone, fix up your home sweet home. I call an 888 money pit. Coast to coast and floorboards to shingles, this is the Money Pit Home Improvement Show. I'm Tom Kreitler. And I'm Leslie Segretti. And we are here to help you with all the projects you want to take on in 2024. If you've got a project in mind, something on your to-do list, something on your new project list, something on your I wish I could have gotten this to the sooner list, whatever you want to do, whether it's decor, repair, remodel, We've got tips and ideas to help you get through it and get it done right the first time. But to get that information, you got to reach out to us with your questions. Two ways to do that. You can go to moneypit.com slash ask. That's moneypit.com slash ask. Or just call us at 1-888-MONEYPIT, 888-666-3974. Coming up on today's show, keeping heating costs down is usually a lot easier for homes heated with gas or oil than for those heated by electricity. But new efficiency technology in heat pumps is changing all of this for the better. So we're going to share some ideas just ahead. And if you're a renter, do you worry about getting your security deposit back when it's time to move out? Well, we're going to share the most commonly overlooked items that stand between you and getting all your security just ahead. And did your furniture pick up a little extra wear and tear over the holidays? We've got hacks to fix water rings, dings, and dents just ahead. But first, if you can dream it, you can build it, and we can help. Reach out with your questions right now at moneypit.com slash ask. We'd love to hear what you are tackling this new year. What are you working on? What are you thinking about working on? Let's get those to-do lists done. So call us right now at 1-888-MONEYPIT. That's 888-666-3974. Let's get to it. Leslie, who's first? Marion, North Carolina is on the line with a mossy roof. Tell us what's going on at your money pit. Well, we have a 10-year-old roof, asphalt shingles, I believe they are, and the sections between shingles are beginning to be filled up with moss. It's like a mossy grout line. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. I'd like to know how to get it safely clean and keep it from growing back again. It isn't the entire roof. We we are in an A-frame house, so it's very, you know, very sharp, very steep roof, and it's just about the uh, eight or ten feet closest to the to the edge. Okay. Do you see it all the way around? You just see it on, say, the north facing side, or in the it's area just on this north facing part? Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's the area that gets the least amount of sunlight. Right. Um, do you have like a large tree that's, you know, adding more shade to this area? We have a lot of trees. Yeah, a lot of trees. Yeah, therein lies the problem. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, the best solution here is can you trim out or thin out those trees in any way to get more sunlight onto that portion of the roof? Because if you can do that, sunlight really is, you know, your best weapon in getting rid of this moss and keeping it away. Now, you'll have to do some work to get it to be gone in the first place. But if you can add more sunlight, you're going to help it stay away. All right. Very good. Thank you very much. Good luck with that project. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Now we've got Luke from Texas who's got a question about insulation. What's going on at your Money Pit? So I've listened to a couple of episodes here recently, and I've noticed a trend of recommending spray foam insulation in the ceilings, or or I shouldn't say in the ceilings, but uh, in between the roof rafters. And I... I was going to I was very interested in doing that in my house. However, I started to become a bit concerned with issues of potential mold. Um I mean, if there's any kind of roof leak, whether it be closed cell or open cell foam that's sprayed, any kind of roof leak, it's going to that foam is going to trap the water in there, won't it? You'd have to have a roof leak that went on for some time for that to happen. You would have evidence of the leak because I have spray foam in my attic and I've covered my rafters with it. 
And uh, we had a really, really bad rainstorm once, and I got a bit of a leak around the chimney from the flashing. But it came right through, and I saw it. I was able to to deal with it. I, I wouldn't worry about that. The one thing about spray foam you need to understand, Luke, is it it when you spray foam an attic, it no longer is a vented attic. It is now an unvented attic on purpose by design, right? So everything is sealed in now, which is the reason it becomes so warm and and as opposed to you know being icy cold like it would most winters. I mean, my attic is practically the same temperature as the rest of my house now, and my energy bills went way down as a result of it. So I don't have that concern at all. And if I did get a roof leak, I think I'd probably spot it pretty quickly. I don't think it's the, the kind of thing that's going to seep in there and sit for a long time and, and be a big discovery later. Interesting. All right. Thank you so much for your input. I appreciate it. Hey, Money Pit Podcast fans. You want to help us out? Well, go ahead and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, and we're going to give you a virtual high five. Plus, you'll be helping us spread the word about our show. Just go to moneypit.com slash review. Marsha in Illinois needs some help getting a window unstuck. Tell us about it. I have a window over my sink in my kitchen, so I have to lean over the sink to raise this window. And uh, it's always been extremely hard to get up or down. And uh, I, I just don't know what to do with it. I, I think I've tried uh, WD-40. Is this a wood window, Marsha? Yes, it's a wood window. So... Probably over the years, it's gotten bigger, swollen in its place, and it's gotten tighter in the jams. And I'll presume with paint, too, over the years that that didn't make it any better. So why don't you think about a replacement window? I mean, look, we can talk to you about taking this whole window apart and sanding down the jams and sanding down the sashes and making it easier to use and replacing the cords and the balance and all that work. I think this would be a good time to treat yourself to a replacement window. You don't have to do all the windows in the house. You know, you can buy a double hung replacement window in a home center today for a couple hundred bucks and it's a pretty good quality window. So you may want to think about replacing just this one window or in the alternative, you can pull the trim off, you can take the sashes apart and you could sand them and sand them well, and that will make them a little bit smaller all the way around and make them easier to operate. And of course, also make sure that the balances are working. Now, if it's an old wood window, you may have cords or chains that go up and you wanna make sure that they're still attached because that gives you a little bit of of assistance as you open and close the window. Okay, well, uh, I appreciate your advice. uh, I guess I'll have to invest in a new window. I, I think it's going to be easier than all the work it would take to get the old window working. And I'm all for easy. And that's why I suggest that. Okay, Marcia, good luck. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Now, look, if you got these old windows, I mean, you can work on them and put eight, 10 hours into a window. And sure, it'll be just as good as new. But why? You know, it's still going to be an old drafty wood window when you can go buy a double pane vinyl clad window replacement window that slips inside the existing opening and just have better energy efficiency and a window that really works tilt in to clean you know the works just doesn't make any sense yeah, you're still gonna have to reach over that sink it's just gonna be easier to work exactly chad in florida's on the line and having a really hard time getting that perfect shower tell us what's going on oh i've got an issue um uh, the house was built in like the uh late 50s early 60s and uh you got to take a shower, and you turn the hot water you think would be up, and then you turn the cold water on, and it just seems like that uh, you know you go to adjust the uh, the cold there, and it's it's uh, it makes a kind of a creaking noise, and uh, you know it's either scalding hot or freezing cold, and you always kind of got to sit there and adjust the uh, the the cold side on the um, um, on the shower there, and it seems to do it more when it starts to get colder out. What you might want to do is think about replacing this with a pressure-balanced valve. A pressure-balanced valve maintains the mix between hot and cold regardless of the pressure in the pipe. So as you pull more water or less water out of one side because either the valve is doing that or somebody's using the water somewhere in the house, the flow of water can change, but the mix, the balance between the hot and the cold will not change. And that just makes it a lot more comfortable and, frankly, a lot safer for you, for you to, to, to use that water. And if you're still using two valves like that, you know, it might be time to upgrade to pressure balance. 
because I think you'll find that that's going to solve this problem. All righty. Yeah, that's what I, that was my next project. I get, just got finished uh, doing it and closing my carport and doing an addition, and the bathroom is coming next. So. Wow. Well, we're happy to help you select the next project, Chad. Hey, I appreciate it. I'm sure your list, you were just wondering what were you going to put on that list, and uh, and, and now, you're, now you're all set. That's right. That's right. It's never ending <laughs> when you're a homeowner, right? Yep, absolutely. Chad, thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Well, saving energy and going green are big goals for homeowners, which is one reason heat pumps are more popular than ever. That's right. Traditional heating systems use fuel like gas or oil to generate heat. Electric heat, on the other hand, has always been much more expensive. But heat pumps, which is a form of electric heat, is actually a much more affordable technology. Now, what heat pumps do is they use a small amount of energy to pull heat out of the air or the ground, and they use it to heat or to cool a space. In its simplest form, heat pumps can heat much like an air conditioner cools a home. It's just that the refrigeration process is reversible, so it allows heat pumps to do both heating and cooling. Now, the biggest advantages of heat pumps is the fact that you don't need to install separate systems to heat and to cool your home. And because they're transferring heat rather than burning fuel to create it, heat pumps are more efficient than a gas furnace. Now, heat pumps do have their disadvantages, too. A common complaint is that they blow cold air. Now, this isn't really true, but they're not designed to put out warm air at the same temperature as a gas or oil furnace, for example, would. The air is cooler, but it's plenty warm enough to keep your home heated, and it heats it very efficiently. Now, if you're considering a heat pump, there are really two types that you need to know about. First, there's air source heat pumps. These work much like your refrigerator. They take heat from the outside, pump it through refrigerant coils, and then it's distributed to your home by a fan. But you might also hear them referred to as an air-to-air heat pump. The reversing valve is the most important part. It flips the operation around. Instead of bringing heat into your home, the heat pump sends the heat outdoors much like an AC would. And the other type is called a ground source heat pump. They operate a little bit differently. They absorb heat exclusively from the ground outside via pipes that are buried and filled with water. Bottom line, For me, I'd still prefer natural gas, but if electric heat was my only option, a well-installed high-tech heat pump is definitely the way to go. Lori, you've got the money pit. How can we help you today? We have a Chamberlain one-quarter horsepower garage door opener, and it has no remotes. We bought the house as is, so we have no remotes for it. Also, it has a keypad on the outside, which I'm unable to use. So my question was, if I go to Home Depot or Lowe's, would a universal remote work, or do I have to call a garage door company out to sell us a Chamberlain remote and program it? Why don't you do this? Why don't you get the model number of the Chamberlain garage door opener, which is probably printed on the back of the unit, go to the Uh Chamberlain website, and get the owner's manual for the door opener. With that owner's manual, you should be able to program the keypad. It'll tell you the right sequence to do that. And also, you most likely can find out from Chamberlain exactly which remote is designed to work with that unit. Now, Chamberlain's a very good company, and in fact, they have a new technology that's called MyQ. And the cool thing about the MyQ technology is you can actually uh, put this MyQ unit in your garage and then you'll be able to open and close your garage door with your smartphone. So they're way ahead of the game on this stuff. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you, too. Is this one too old to do that? Um, I think it actually works on every garage door opener that was built after 1996, so it may not be. It might be fine. I can't remember if it's 96 or 94. Yeah, it, it goes back over 10 years. Good. Okay, this, is, this one's about six years old. I think that's how I would proceed. I would not just go buy something and hope it works. I would do the research, and you'll figure it out. Okay, Lori? Okay. Okay, I'll go on their webpage. Thank you for the advice. You're welcome. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Leroy in Delaware is on the line with a flooring question. What can we do for you? I have a question on the laminated flooring. Number one is, is it a solid color all the way through? And number two, where I would be using this has chairs with rollers on them. <clears throat> and I was wondering if you thought that would hold up with a being being a chair had rollers on them. All right, so first of all, is the solid color all the way through? No, that's not the way laminate floors work. So the way laminate floors work is you have different types of composite materials, and then you have sort of the color layer, which is essentially sort of a photograph, and then you have the wear layer on top of that, which can be textured so it can look like stone or feel like stone, I should say, or, or wood boards. Now, this textured sort of wear layer surface, it's available in different levels of durability. Some 
floors are designed for light use, some floors are designed for commercial use. If you, you know, buy a tougher floor, one of the one of the better quality floors that's designed for the heavier use, I don't think you can have any trouble with those with those chairs on the rollers. Now, uh, is there, are all the chairs and rollers? Or is this like a desk chair situation? Uh, well, actually, it's a kitchen table with uh, four chairs and rollers. Oh, okay, going on. all right. Yeah, I think that a laminate floor is a good choice for that. But like I said, you got to buy a good quality one. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks so much for calling us at eight 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 Money Pit. All right, now we've got Cheryl in Texas on the line, who's looking to redo a bathroom and make it more modern with just a shower. How can we help you? Well, um, I am the mother of four sons, and as they get bigger, they no longer like to get in the bathtub. And <laughs> right. okay. we find that they are always in my room, in my shower. We're wanting to um, take out the tub that's in their bathroom and turn it into a shower. My issue is I don't have a lot of space. Um, it's a Hollywood bath, and then the tub and toilet are in a separate little room that you can close off. Mm -hmm. And the door facing um, of that little room sits right next to the tub itself. So my question is, is when I pull that tub out, the plan was to put a, you know, a shower pan down and, and tile the area and then put a, a glass door, either a sliding door, door on there. Um, will that be a wide enough space if it's only the width of a standard tub? Cheryl, I think you definitely can find a shower pan that can fit the width of that tub sort of elbow to elbow if you're standing in it. I mean, think about it. If you're in the tub, you're taking a shower, right? you got room on, on the, to the right and to the left of you. So we want a shower pan that essentially is the same size. Now, when it comes to residential prefabricated shower pans, they start at around 24 by 24, so that's two foot square. You know, that would be probably, you know, the smallest that you would need, but you might be able to go up even bigger. But a little trick of the trade, if you were to find, for example, that for whatever reason, the way this room is configured, a 24 by 24 would not work, then you should shop for a smaller shower pan, which you will find sold for RVs, recreational vehicles, because they have tiny showers in them, right? And there's a whole host of RV shower pans that are smaller than 24 by 24. I don't think you're going to need it. I think you'll be fine starting there, maybe even going up. But the size of the shower pan is what you want to figure out first, and then you can basically build around that. Okay? Does that make sense? Sure. Sure. That's what I want to do. Okay. All right, Cheryl. Good luck with that project. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 888- Money Pit. Hey, Leslie, I ran across a, a news story of truly national importance. I mean, this is so important. I could not pass it up. It is very controversial, but I want to get okay. your feedback on this. All right. Something people care deeply about. Here's the question. What is the right number of throw pillows to have on a couch? Ah. Uh. <laughs> There's a story on the Spruce about this. I'm like, really? People care about this? Okay. Probably not my thing, but I would ask you. It's a love-hate relationship because (laughs) if you have them, they better look perfect all the time and not be like thrown on the floor and askew. And my kids like to sit on them so they get squished. So it's like I'm super selective about throw pillows. Like they're not going to be comfy. They're going to be super hard so that nobody's tushy can squish them down too much because they choose to be a perch. Like it's ridiculous. So I prefer like (laughs) a special one or none, or you better have no kids in the house or pets. I mean, come on, throw pillows. It's a, it's a, it's a subject. Well, they talk about the number of pillows based on corners, the sofa size and the style matter. They talk about the golden ratio for pillow groupings. Uh, One of the experts (laughs) recommends a grouping of three pillows with specific sizes. Odd numbers. Yes. A 22 by 22, a 20 by 20 and a 14 by 20. That sounds like a nightmare. So apparently there's a magic grouping and then it's very important to balance your pillow placement. Okay. I get that. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Anyway, it's all from the Spruce. Check them out uh, online. I believe it's thespruce.com. Great newsletter I get with tips like that in every week. Dean in Kansas, you've got the money pit. How can we help you today? Okay, we've just purchased a home, and in that home we've got a traditional gas water heater. Okay. And my wife loves to take baths every night. She's one of those really hot baths type person. <laughs> okay, good for her. Just wanted to kind of know what the best setting for the water heater was. We've been told a couple different things. Mm-hmm. Usually we turn it all the way up and Ooh, that's um, really hot. We've been told some different things. So 
Yeah. Well, I mean, is it just you and your wife, or do you have kids too? We do have kids as well. Yeah. You you want to be careful with the children, especially. You don't want the water to be any hotter than about 110 to 120 degrees. And if you turn it all the way up, it can get close to 160, and that's really dangerous. So, I mean, if you have a 40 gallon water heater and you're taking a a, a big bath every night, I think you're going to have to adjust your schedules around that. That's going to use a significant amount of it, but it also has a pretty fast recovery. If you opt at some point in the future, if you're there in the house for a number of years and you want to get a water heater that's never going to run in hot water, you should opt for a tankless water heater. They're a little bit more expensive than a tank water heater, but they basically provide you an endless supply um, of hot water. So I think those are your options, Dean. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Well, if you've been renting, you'll definitely want to make sure you get your security deposit back when your lease ends. But for that to happen, landlords want to see that their property has been taken care of and left in good condition for the next tenant. So to help, here are five simple things that tenants often forget to do that can leave their rental home looking its best and make a good impression on the landlord when it's time to go. Now, first, you want to clean the stovetops and the oven. Burner guards collect a lot of food buildup, and there might be burn marks, so give them a good scrub with bleach or a kitchen cleanser. For baked-on residue inside the oven, you can make your own cleaner with a baking soda mixture or use a chemical oven cleaner. Be sure to wipe down vertical surfaces like mirrors, walls, doors, windows, and cabinets using vinegar or alcohol wipes to remove the dust, the streaks, the scuff marks. All of that will go unnoticed if you take the time to do this now. Also, use a duster, rags, or vacuum to get rid of all the dust that collects on the blinds, the ceiling fans, the vents, the windowsills, moldings, baseboards. You basically want it to look spick and span, like super clean. This way, there's nothing to really attract their attention. Yeah, and if you have a washer or dryer in there, leave them sparkling both inside and out. You want to wipe off any splotches on the outside and run an empty load in the washing machine with vinegar instead of fabric softener to leave it fresh and clean inside. And don't forget about those hidden areas behind and under movable appliances and furniture. Really take a look around the stove, the microwave, the refrigerator, and any furniture that's staying behind to see if anything has fallen back in those nooks and crannies. And remember to sweep up any dirt and debris. I mean, generally the standard is broom clean. So if you leave it broom clean, you should be good to go. Yeah, and you know what? Take pictures of everything that you've done on the way out so that there's no surprises or somebody can say like, oh, but you left a hole here or this was that. This way, nobody can make a claim against you because you've got proof. Oh, that is that is so true. Linda, you've got the money pit. How can we help you today? The house that we live in uh, was built in 53. It's ours. We, we've paid it off and trying to keep up, keep it and keep it in good shape. But in... Uh, between the dining room and the living room, apparently before we purchased it, there was a wall that had been removed. And the only sign is on the ceiling where the wall was removed. Uh, there's a, a double crack like on each side of a two before is what it looks like about that width in the drywall. And I've tried to use it's a, a textured ceiling. They did, we actually had knockdown put on it, but it, uh, We can't fill the crack. We've tried to use drywall mud. It just returns. What can I do to fix this crack? So this was opposite both sides of a wall that was torn out, so they must have slipped in some drywall to to patch it. Is that what you're thinking? Maybe. Maybe. So that's not the best way. That's not the best way to fix that sort of thing. You can't like put a narrow strip in there and have it ever look like a normal ceiling. If you've got a hole like that where you pull the wall out, what you have to do is cut a bigger piece of drywall out, maybe about a foot or two on each side of it, uh, and you do that right on the edge where the floor joists are, the ceiling joists are in this case. Then you have a bigger seam to tape and spackle and secure. And when the, if that's done well, then you're never going to see it again. So you putting all of this spackle on it time and time again over all of this, you know, all of this period of time is is probably made more of a mess and it's kind of hard to fix at this point. So what I would tell you to do is to cut out that whole repair, put a bigger piece of drywall in, um, tape it, spackle it, prime the whole ceiling and then repaint the whole ceiling. And that would be the one to do the way to do this, you know, permanently. Otherwise, you're always going to see that. Okay, thank you for telling me that. Good luck. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit.
Give us a call here at the Money Pit and let us know what you are working on. We've got up for grabs this hour the Marble Dream Resurfacing Kit from Dice Coatings. This is a super easy roll-on resurfacing kit that makes your countertops, your vanity, even tabletops look like marble. Lots of great choices, defined veins, swirling veins. It's an awesome kit worth 169 bucks. Check it out at DiceCoatings.com. Going out to one lucky listener drawn at random, make that you reach out to us right now with your home improvement or decor questions at 1-888-MONEYPIT. Vincent in Texas is putting up a fence and needs some help with the project. What can we do for you? Yeah, I'm putting up a chain link in front of my house. Uh, where my house is, it's in the dip of the, the street. Both the street goes up on each end. Okay. And I'm about four blocks from the lake. And we had a lot of rain and our water levels up. And when I'm about 14 inches down, I'm hitting water. Okay. Um, is there a special cement, or how should I do that in setting the post? Okay, so what you want to do is, um, because it's chain link, you're going to want to dig down about three feet and try to do that with a post hole digger, even if you hit water. And then the way you deal with this is you mix up concrete, like a, like a quick creep product, uh-huh. some basic, basic uh, concrete mix, mix it up in a wheelbarrow to the right consistency, and then shovel it into the hole and let it displace the water that's in the hole. Does that make sense? So as you put the concrete in, the water will kind of work its way right out. And what will be left will be the concrete. It will dry nice and rock solid, and you'll be good to go. Okay, thank you. You saved me a lot of worry. All right. Don't worry about it. That's the way to handle that. Mix it out of the hole, and then drop it in the hole, and the water will displace. Good luck. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Well, now that the holiday season has passed, is your furniture looking a little worse for the wear? Did you pick up a few new rings, dings, dents? Well, here's a few hacks to help you bring that furniture back to shape. So first, let's talk about those white rings. Those are caused when water vapor penetrates the finish, and they're easy to remove. All you do is wipe them gently with a cloth that's barely dampened with denatured alcohol. Now, shallow chips... Where a clear finish is chipped, but the underlying color is still intact, you can fill that ding with a few drops of clear nail polish. And the trick here is to kind of do it in layers, too, depending on how deep that ding is. After the polish dries, you can sand flush with 600-grit sandpaper. And then if you want to restore the sheen on satin finishes, you can rub with a 4 aught steel wool and paste wax. For gloss finishes, you can go ahead and use auto-polishing compound and a rag. Now let's talk about those big scratches and the worn edges. A felt tip touch-up marker works really well for worn edges and scratches. They come in a variety of wood tones to match common furniture finishes. You can use them to color large scratches or edges where the stain is worn away. Apply them only to the damaged area and then wipe immediately if any gets on the neighboring finish. And finally, apply a coat of paste wax over the repair and the entire adjacent surface to impart a very even and lovely sheen. And you will see scratches no more. Shawnee in North Carolina needs some help with a backyard problem. What's going on at your money pit? No, my room, when it would rain, all the water would drain toward the back because it's on the down slope. Right. And then I had some a contractor come in and connect all my downspouts and all to this black pipe, and they connected all of it and ran it out to one source toward the end you know, of that little creek. And in doing so, I mean, everything was fine. It worked fine. And they thought where I was having such water problems, they sort of made a horseshoe out of the black pipe with the styrofoam, you know, peanuts and all of that in it. But what they did when they dug around the horseshoe area, they found that that was dry because they figured if it was wet, it would drain and take care of the problem. But when they put that horseshoe in, wherever they put it, it was completely dry and it was further down that they realized that I had underground spring. So all of my drain pipes, everything's draining perfectly, but it's one little problem I had with that underground spring. But is that underground spring rising up to the point where the yard is flooding? And how much how much flooding are we talking about here? Uh, it's not necessarily flooding, but it it's stays wet. wet. I can't mow it. And there's a place about, uh, I'm going to say, 12 inches square squarish maybe that is has puddled. I don't think this is a problem worth solving. I think it's a fairly small area of the yard and, and areas of the yard that get soft like that. Yeah, the grass can be hard to cut sometimes. Sometimes you have to cut it by hand instead of using a, a you know power mower on it. But 
I don't think it's worth you doing anything about it. You would have to do some major, major work to try to uh, take the water that's collecting there, run it downstream, and have it sit somewhere else. So I don't think it's necessarily a, a big issue. Shawnee, thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Ken reached out to Team Money Pit and says, We have a whole house fan and recently added more insulation to our attic. There used to be a wooden hatch between the attic and the second floor ceiling that we removed to run the fan, but the contractor covered it. Is there a better, more automatic option? Yeah, there definitely is. But before we do that, let's just explain to everybody what a whole house fan is, because we're not talking about an attic fan here. Now, what a whole house fan is, is it actually sits in the upper hallway of your house. So so let's say if it's a two-story colonial, it would be the second floor hallway ceiling. And it basically points takes the air from the house, pulls it up into the attic, and then there's big vents in the attic where that air will now go out. It will be pushed out of the attic. And what's really cool about a whole house fan is that in the summer, for example, you can use it on a timer. So in our house some years ago, we had one with a whole house fan. We went to bed, we would turn the fan on on a timer, and it would run for like 30 minutes while we were falling asleep with a nice breeze through the house. You'd open a couple of windows. And then it would go off, and we would never have to run the air conditioning after that. You know, we were asleep and happy as clams at that point. So it's a really nice thing to have in a house. But you do need to have the ventilation provided for that. You need to have the space provided for that. So if your area was closed off, what you need to do is this. First of all, you need to build a chase around where the fan is. By chase, I mean kind of like a wood box that holds the insulation back from it. And then there's a type of register that you can put at the bottom of this that automatically will open up. It's on springs, and when the fan kicks on, the suction of the fan will draw this register open, and the air will pull through it. And then when the fan goes off, it will automatically close. So that's what you're missing here. You don't have to remove or replace a box or a plank or anything like that. You can maximize that insulation, just keep it away from the fan, uh, and then use the automatic register to control when the air gets into the house. All right, next up, Nick wrote in saying, now that it's really cold outside, my hardwood foyer and tiled kitchen floors are really cold, even with the heat set to 70 degrees. Is it worthwhile to insulate the ceiling joists of the basement? Oh, I would say yes. Yeah, I think it's never a bad idea to insulate a basement ceiling. I mean, in fact, in my house, which has hardwood floors, uh, but a very old house, I actually insulated the ceiling joists over the crawl space, and it made a nice difference. So you want to make sure that when you do this project that you extend the insulation all the way to the outskirts of the house, the box beam, we call that. This is where the floor beams sit on the foundation, and that's really important because a lot of chilly air gets in there. The best insulation would be to use fiberglass bat insulation sized properly for the spacing of the joist. And what you do is you push it up there, and then you use a little piece of wire that actually is called a lightning rod because it goes in quickly and it holds the insulation up and it sticks into the adjacent joist to keep it from falling out. So it's a pretty easy project to do uh, and it's one that will definitely make you more comfortable and give you a great return on investment. All right, Nick, I hope that helps you out because nothing is worse than those cold floors, especially during the winter months when you're trying to get ready in the morning and your tootsies are freezing. Let's fix that. You are listening to the Money Pit Home Improvement Show on air and online at moneypit.com. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of your day with us. We hope that you found some tips and advice in this episode that are useful to you. If you've got questions for us, if you've got a project that you would really like to tackle in 2024 and just don't know where to start, what to do first, whether you need to do it yourself or you can hire a pro, reach out to us 24-7 by calling one 888 Money Pit, that's 888-666-3974. Or for the fastest possible response, just go to moneypit.com slash ask and click the blue microphone button. Until then, I'm Tom Kreitler. And I'm Leslie Segretti. Remember, you can do it yourself. But you don't have to do it alone. 